Welcome back to another episode of The Political Life. Today, we are bringing you Ryan Shea. Ryan is a former Hill staffer, uh, turned advocate, turned lobbyist. And um, we are going to hear uh, all uh, from Ryan about all his, his work on the Hill and his current employment. Uh, our first interview uh, or meeting or lunch got postponed. Um, because Ryan, um, he had a uh, he and his wife had a child uh, that was coming eleven days early, and so um, Ryan, first of all, uh, congratulations on the birth of your daughter. Oh, thanks, Jim. Yes, it's been an exciting time in the in the Shea house. You know, we kind of have this quasi lifelong client now in the house that uh, has some very strong opinions. And, and the fee structure, as I was just telling Jim, she pays us in smiles and diapers. And so it's a, a little bit different than what I'm, I'm used to, but it's a pleasure to be here to talk with you. Uh, just for, for your listeners, I'm Ryan Shea. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Regulatory Affairs at the law firm here in D.C. called Fagery, Drinker, Biddle & Reef. We have uh, locations all across the U.S. and the world, and, and I'm part of our consultant practice, and so I manage a number of clients serve on a number of client teams to support their objectives, their priorities in Congress, from the authorizing or the policy side to the appropriation side, which is where I spend a lot of time on the Hill, which concerns funding. And so certainly picked a heck of a week to come back last week from paternity leave to all of the turmoil in the House. But it just, as Jim and I were just talking about, it brought back a lot of memories of what it's like to be a staffer during noteworthy events, I think is a, a fair to say, a very benign description. And, and just as a staffer, I was there during COVID, during uh, the January 6th insurrection, during the uh, election of 2016, and the, all the changes that that brought and all the turbulence of the Trump administration and was there for the latter part of the Obama administration. And then, of course, uh, the opening few chapters of, of the Biden administration before moving downtown. So it brought back a lot of memories and seeing friends of mine on the floor and members that, that, that I know. And, and actually 100 percent of the television that, that my daughter has watched has been C-SPAN. <laughs> <laughs> we, we sat down and watched the votes and, and and she's at the point now where she can concentrate and look at something. And and I, I think at some point she just wanted to help out Kevin McCarthy and, and just get a few more votes for him. <laughs> she just wanted to get involved. But but anyway, so, so yeah, I'm a longtime Hill staffer. I'm, I'm an aficionado of Congress. That's my favorite branch. It's my favorite building, my favorite institution. And, and uh, since I was fairly young, I, I wanted to make it in D.C. And, and to spend some time on the Hill as a staffer. You know, I think a lot of us got caught up in growing up watching the West Wing and, and seeing the, 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 I think the romance of government service behind the scenes rather than just at the podium. And, and uh, I had an opportunity to, to intern with the now chair of the Appropriations Committee, Patty Murray from Washington State, which is where I'm from. And that was my first taste. And at, at one point they said, you know, Ryan, go home at 7 p.m. And, and I didn't want to. And, and I figured, you know, I'm going to chase this feeling for, for as long as I can. And uh, so did, did a stint there and another with uh, Senator Maria Cantwell and Bob Casey from Washington and Pennsylvania, respectively. And then, and this was before they paid was interns, this, right? <laughs> was this during college? This was, yes, during graduate school. I did my graduate work at Villanova. I go Nova to all the Wildcats listening. And um, and so I, came, so I came to D.C. With, with an unpaid internship at the time. You know, as a Democrat, not a great time to be trying to make it on the Hill. Republicans had the House. They had uh, we're, we're about to win back the Senate, and then of course, of course they did. And so, you know, that's a it's a it's a difficult thing to crack the nut on on getting in, getting a job in, in Congress. And but I wanted to do it so badly that it was worth worth the risk. Uh, and so I worked in the Senate actually for the majority of my time on the Hill. First on the Committee of Energy and Natural Resources, which helped got to help run the hearings and make a few C-SPAN, you know, photo bombs in the back, <laughs> you know, while you're running around and, and helping those hearings run. And what I, what I appreciated about that is I, I was in a non-designated capacity. So I served both Republicans and Democrats. And we worked on a number of, you know, big energy bills and number of issues. And I think that just what I appreciated about this started my 
time on the Hill, I think on the right foot, right? On a not particularly partisan foot, but in a consensus driven posture, right? Where you developed a lot of relationships with both sides of the aisle around, around the things they cared about. And I think this got more adept at looking at policy from those that are on the other side of the aisle, right? I think so much of the challenge is it's difficult for staff and Americans writ large to see what are things like from the perspective of uh, folks that you don't agree with, right? And and where are the areas that you can work together? So that was wonderful. And then I went to the personal office uh, for me, a cat, well, from also from Washington State, a big member of the Finance Committee, now the chair of, of the Commerce Committee in the Senate, and helped run her health team. And we had all these plans for a Hillary Clinton uh, administration. And then one night in November, all of those went into the trash, right? And and we needed to find ourselves a, a new plan. And, you know, I had a couple of gigs lined up, one potentially in her White House, and suddenly, you know, in your mid-20s realizing, oh, this is going to take a pause. And, and I think that's something that is probably not uh, un unusual or, or unique to me, where the, you know, the ups and downs of your careers can be shaped by elections that you have no influence over, right? I think that's one thing that makes this industry unique. And, and so that was a, a lesson, you know, it was like, okay, you can do the perfect staff work, you know, you can back the right person, but if 30,000 people in three states think differently, then you're going to do something different. And so then the next two years were just all defense, right? I was there when John McCain gave his thumbs down through in then all four repeals of, attempted repeals rather, the Affordable Care Act and, you know, was dodging, you know, people that were squatting in the hallway to protest the you know, the votes there. And so that was a, a formative time because I thought what I wanted to accomplish on the Hill was passing bills. And in this case, it was keeping a bill from getting repealed. And uh, so that was a formative time. And then I was able to do quite a bit in the opiate and heroin academic space. And so that was a big issue back in 2017, 2018, especially, of course, it still is right now with fentanyl. Uh, but that was, that was my first foray into managing a portfolio on my own. How did you get your first full-time job? Uh, so that was with the Committee of Energy and Natural Resources. I had interned with them part-time while I was with Senator Maria Cantwell and the, the non-designated. And that just led to a full-time job? That's right. Got and, it. and a fun little tidbit there is, is at the time, Senator Lisa Murkowski was the chair. And since it was a non-designated capacity, essentially you needed you know, the okay of both uh, the ranking member, Maria Cantwell, and the, and the chair, Lisa Murkowski. And Murkowski's, you know, wanted someone that had some sort of Alaska ties. And in a previous life, I was a, a bus driver and a tour guide up in Juneau, Alaska. And when I was trying to make money for, for grad school. And so who knew, you know, what this sort of random thing would help thread the needle, you know, on the first job on the Hill. So that's, that's where I got the start. That's great. And do you remember when McCain was walking down the aisle and giving the thumbs down? Um, was that for you staffers um, in the chamber at the time? Did you know that was coming? Um, what do you recall of that moment? Well, no one knew anything. I mean, there was okay. there was sort of this murmur that he might do something mavericky, <laughs> right? That he might might do mm -hmm. something. And but but no one had a had a clue. And that was such a long night. And very rarely are votes, you know, unknown. Right. The outcome is is unknown. That, that's so rare, which is what made last week so bizarre. You know, mm -hmm. you know, votes in the House or Senate typically are predetermined to some capacity. And mm -hmm. here you had, you know, everyone was glued to certain senators, Twitter accounts, to their body language. Right. Like everyone was playing a psychologist in some ways. And I thought from his body language that, OK, this something might happen here. And mm -hmm. then, we, you know, when he held it so dramatically, it was, mm -hmm. you know, shocking. And, you know, I, I was just despairing, in, you know, as a Democratic staffer, because, I mean, the, all the political incentives pointed towards this repeal. And what people often forget is that that vote actually wasn't to pass the bill that would repeal the ACA. It was the, it was to essentially allow a conference bill to be negotiated, or at least mm. modifications to the House bill, right? It was, I think, I believe it was called the skinny repeal 
is what we called it at the time. But there was this, right. it was not expected that that legislation was going to be the legislation that was signed into law. But, it, but what it did was, if we can't even agree to essentially get on the bill to get on the right. topic, we can't do that. But what I was concerned about was if you essentially are able to get a version of a bill passed by one chamber and considered by the other and so on, you can't walk that back, right? Like the details are going to get worked out and you're going to get it passed. And so that vote was so critical because it basically just killed the repeal efforts until Graham Cassidy later on in the fall. But it was, it was if that was so difficult under that time, it, you know, it portended that a more substantive repeal was, was unlikely. And that was a, a relief because... In the health space, it's not esoteric, right? It's people's lives, it's their livelihoods. And, and I think that at the time there was incredible relief on the part of staff and advocates, you know, because the CBO, I am convinced, played a role here. And, uh, you know, very often people don't even know what the CBO is. It sounds like something you'd order from a menu or something. But, but the CBO reports about how many Americans would lose their health insurance as a result of repeal, particularly in the Medicaid space, right? And, and there's rumors that per capita caps could be coming back under the new Republican House. And so that brought back some memories from a few years ago. And, and so, but I think it actually changed and moved some minds. I mean, McCain gets most of the airtime, but people forget about Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, right? Like his mm -hmm. thumbs down wouldn't have mattered if, if both of them didn't take a stand. And they were uh, I mean, you can almost watch the the footage now and zoom in, and you can see how they were cornered, but they they stood strong and said, "No, this isn't what's right for my state and what not what I believe in." And so that was a a, a big moment in in my Hill career, certainly, and and then was able to be involved in a lot of you know, perspective or moving the ball forward policy provisions, not just keeping things on the books. And uh, and the first of that was was opiates, and so. Uh, that was something that was done through the Support Act that President Trump signed in, in uh, the latter part of 2018. And goodness gracious, as a staff, seeing something you worked on get signed into law, I, I don't know what's higher than that. It was, it was such a thrill. And, and it's like, okay, let's, let's do some more because our work isn't done. Were, were you able to, uh, did you attend the bill signing? No, I, I had to stay on stay on the hill, but you better believe I watched all of it on on TV, and uh, that was pretty exciting. <laughs> he almost forgot to sign the bill, uh, President Trump, at the time. They, you know, he gave a, a wonderful speech, and you know, a lot of the members that were really involved there, and and he, then he almost forgot, and Melania had to remind him that no, you need to sign the bill. And so we're just looking at him like, oh my gosh, just sign the thing, and uh, and so have that have that bill or a signed copy here here at home, which is such a treasure. Uh, and so that, that was that was really special. And then what tell us about your last years on Capitol Hill. Yeah, so so I helped the last couple helped on uh, Senator Cantwell's reelection in 18 and that, you know, presented an opportunity where, you know, Democrats have now have majority in the House. And that had a number of things that were very interesting to me and wanting to get bicameral experience because uh, a lot of folks are they're Senate people or they're House people. You know, there are some that have done both, but but typically you're one or the other. And and I didn't want to be on the Hill for 20 years. I knew eventually I'd want to do private sector work and, and just wanted to have experience in both. And so an opportunity came around to work for a wonderful gentleman from uh, Indiana named Andre Carson. I uh, represents Indianapolis there and was able to work for him for well over two years during uh, the first impeachment, uh, which he was intimately in, well, we were all involved with it because he was on the Intelligence Committee and, and of course, Chairman Schiff was running that. And, and so that was like, oh, okay, I think this is gonna be very exciting over here in the House. And and then, you know, we, we all limped into 2020, we're like, oh, okay, things are gonna be easy this year. And then uh, and then we hear about this, this novel illness uh, across the ocean and um, I'm from Washington State, I think I mentioned, and Washington State was, you know, one of the first places to get hit really hard. And uh, my brother, who's a police officer, was having to quarantine because of exposure. And it was this very early taste of what we were all going to eventually deal with. But as a health staffer, as I, I, I ran uh, Congressman Carson's health team, I essentially had to turn into a full-time COVID expert. Our full-time expert on what we knew about the epidemiology of it, on transmission, on 
are not? How does public health strategies work? I mean, that's the fun part, I think, as Hill's staff is you have to become a self-taught expert based on what Congress is doing and what your boss is interested in. And so if you have, you know, untapped or unlimited intellectual curiosity, Hill staff is like the best job, right? And, and I, I'd always been really afraid to live through a pandemic. You know, I wasn't really worried about a war, but a pandemic, this seems especially scary. And here 2020 goes, hey, here you go. And uh, oh, by the way, it's your job to handle this and advise, you know, a member of Congress on that. And I remember one moment during the CARES Act debate in March of 2020 going, Congress in a divided capacity with a Republican president is about to pass over, you know, a trillion dollar bill and almost no one is going to oppose it oh, this is bad. <laughs> you know, it's kind of one of these like inverse perspectives that you have in D.C. It's like since there's no rancor and no opposition, it's passing. Oh, yeah, this is really going to be bad. <laughs> so that was one of my oh, crap moments. And um, and so, you know, that was in some ways a defi- the defining experience for me was being a health staffer during hopefully, knock on wood, a once in a century pandemic. And some of the biggest packages passed by Congress ever, even when adjusting for inflation and a a fairly dramatic expansion of the government's investments in healthcare. Right. You think about the innovations in the telehealth space and the pharmaceutical uh, space. You you think about what like Cures 2.0 did in setting up these partnerships with private entities to essentially fast track the research of vaccine. That's why we have a Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J vaccines. And so to see that policy borne out in real time and try to figure out how to essentially build the plane while we're flying it and it's on fire and getting shot at, like whatever analogy you want to use, it felt like maybe being like a military legislative assistant during a a war or something. It was so all consuming and touching everything that it was difficult to, you know, put it away. But at the same time, it was an incredible privilege because there was this realization that you're a part of something that is actually meaningful and could be the difference between some people living or dying and how well our economy deals with that. And so that was, was, was probably the seminal experience of, of my Hill time, uh, for better or for worse, right? And, and so that was very meaningful to be a part of. And for you to get, edu- how, how, how would you get educated on the issue, if you remember, number one and number two, you must have had to interact with constituents and in, in trying to educate them as to what you knew uh, and what you thought at the time. I can't imagine how difficult that must have been. Well, I mean, there was one moment in particular that I remember being on the call with a number of the Indiana health systems, and this must have been in, I don't know, March or maybe even early April. And it was essentially at the time where states were taking initiative to close certain things down and and mitigate certain activities, right? Some hospitals were, you know, suspending elective procedures. They were essentially having to come up with this on their own because the federal government had other ideas. And I remember being on this call with the Indiana Health Systems and and one of their executives that not a particularly prone to hyperbole said, well, if Congress doesn't give us an influx of cash because of these restrictions, we're going out of a business by the end of the quarter. And that's when you could hear a pin drop on the call when you realize, oh, are we actually getting to the point where our health system could actually collapse, right? Like, could we get to a point where societal infrastructure starts to unravel? And Mm -hmm. I had had a number of concerns in that space particular. One of the things that I do is, you know, when I want to learn about something, especially if I have to, I I tend to obsess over it and read everything that I can on it, whether that's a book, long-form article, research paper, whatever. And one of the things that had been constantly swirling back in my mind is what happens when the basic infrastructure of society begins to break down. And one of the things that I was particularly worried about was the health systems, but then also basic sanitation. Like what happens if the garbage men stop collecting trash? 
what happens mm -hmm. if folks don't show up to, to handle wastewater treatment, right? And what happens if the hospitals and clinics close, right? Like what we've seen is that typically bad, very bad things happen, right? And so I was very concerned that that's where we kind of hit the bottom of how bad it got from a societal mm -hmm. management perspective. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, uh, I was just going to add, you know, uh, grocery store shelves being empty. Yes. You want to talk about real, um, you know, social unraveling. Um, exactly, exactly. The best, in my opinion, the best pandemic film, and I've seen them all because I hate myself apparently, <laughs> is, uh, is Contagion. Contagion is the most sober-minded, nuanced view of what a pandemic of essentially influenza would look like in the modern context. And they really uh, kind of gave a lot of color to what I was, was reading about what it looks like, to your point exactly, what it looks like when grocery stores run out of goods, when the supply chain infrastructure breaks down completely. You know, toilet paper became this sort of archetype of this challenge, right? And so we certainly constituents were going, you know, I just lost my job. You know, I can't pay the bills. It's still cold, right? Like I, I, I can't afford the heat. You know, what do I believe on the sources? The president is saying one thing, but Secretary Azar is saying another, and Dr. Fauci is saying a third thing, right? So there was there was a lot of education efforts that needed to take place. And then you dealt with misinformation, obviously was a massive challenge from the beginning of the pandemic. And then given the community that Congressman Carson represented, a uh, heavily uh, black community, a large minority community, who faced disproportionate impacts down the line, right, from hospitalizations to infections to mortalities. So there was an additional layer of this challenge of, you know, the, the saying is when, when white America gets a cold, you know, black America gets pneumonia or the flu, right? And, and, and that lesson was viscerally borne out in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic. But it also provided an opportunity, I think, for the majority culture to have a conversation about that, right? Where now conversations about health disparities are not especially partisan. And there's opportunities to, to do some good work there. So, so crisis, you know, while it reveals character in a lot of ways, I think it, it also is an opportunity to make some changes, to make some reforms, change some attitudes. And, and I think COVID certainly allowed that. And I think the easiest way to see it is in that telehealth space. What do you miss most about working on the Hill? Oh, goodness. I mean, there's something about going to the Capitol and that's your workplace. Uh, it's an intangible, right? Like you can't put a, a dollar sign on it. You, you know, it doesn't make your bank account larger, but it, there's a romance to it, I think. And to, it's the temple of, of our representative republic, our, our democracy, I, and it's just a stunning place to work. I think being there during big moments uh, is something I, I certainly miss, and, be, and, and the sense that you're a part of this incredible experiment, right? And one of the things that I did was when I left the Hill and started my job, I, I, I wrote just kind of a, a reflection on LinkedIn of just about my time. And one of the things that stood out to me now I was thinking about this is that, you know, this democracy thing is super fragile, right? And we really did not have a democracy from the fall of the Roman Republic pretty much until the United States gave it a try, you know, multiple millennia later. And this is in the, the wake of January 6th and all the attacks on democracy and voting. And you realize that you know, this is not set in stone. Like, this is not the way that it's always going to be unless we work at it. So as Hill staff, I mean, you're on the front lines there. You know, it's like, his, hey, is this whole representative democracy thing going to work? And you get to be a part of that. And you get to be a part, uh, or excuse me, around people that are some of the most passionate, smart, collaborative people that you'll ever meet. And it, it, that excitement in that environment is infectious in, in a good way, <laughs> not like COVID, like in a, in a good way. And it's hard to want to leave that. And I, I certainly absolutely still miss it. But as a lobbyist, I still go. Uh, I just still leave at the end of the day. You know, it's kind of like having nieces and nephews. You know, you get your fix, but then you, then you send them back to then the mom and go. dad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I was there on uh, last Monday, excuse me, last Tuesday for the speaker vote and was there 
receptions and seeing members that, that I'd worked with and welcomed them back. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go grab some lunch and watch the vote, and then I'll go back for the reception for the rest of the day. I never went back because <laughs> the members uh, were, were there doing some votes for some time. And, I, and the other part, I think, is g- getting the chance to work from the side of a, a member of Congress or senator with stakeholders that you really care about and help them, right? Mm-hmm. And, and making government responsive to them. And it's not this faceless, unhelpful, unthoughtful sort of Leviathan that some people think it is. You can kind of personalize it and say, okay, like, let's, let's work together. Let's, like when you got like an appropriations, you know, community project funding request through or a particular authorizing change that, you know, just lights up their face and helps them do their jobs better. I mean, what better high than that, right? To help government be responsive to people in a meaningful way and not making it so big that it's unhelpful, but just delivering meaningful incremental reform for organizations you care about. For me, that was, uh, did a lot of work in the pancreatic cancer research space. And we had a, a huge push in 2020 with the passing of uh, Congressman Lewis, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice. And so what we were able to do was when the, uh, the end of your omnibus there, there's a, a program that DOD is doing, congressionally directed medical research, to get a massive plus up for that program and some report language that incorporated some really important values around underrepresented communities. And, and the, those got signed into law. And then you realize this could play a role in treatments, you know, hopefully, you know, a cure at some point, you know, it is just someone that cares deeply about health and health policy. That was a, a truly remarkable experience to be a part of because it's like, oh, we can still do big things that have incredible impact, even under the most challenging of political dynamics, political contexts. And so that I miss working with the PanCam people, right? I mean, this this folks that are that are passionate and and when you're able to help deliver, there's nothing better. And that was mostly new funding for research? That's right. That's right, yes. I uh, did a ton of work uh, with Congressman Carson on that, led his work there, with, also with Chair Eshoo uh, and Senator Whitehouse over in the Senate. And, and we were able to double the money uh, that, that the DOD, I mean, a lot of folks don't know about, you know, the congressionally, uh, you know, the excuse me, the congressionally directed research that the DOD does uh, started off as this nexus of issues impacting service members, and now has grown to this hmm. incredible, you know, organization that's doing great research, particularly in prostate cancer and, and, and other other types of cancer, and and so that was a way of oh, okay, we can still do proactive, prospective health investments even in a time where it's it's challenging to get additional funding for programs outside of just keeping pace with inflation. And, uh, and so, and we had some, some changes in NDAA as well. So, so, I mean, that was, that was quite, quite the experience. And then after Biden was elected, I uh, was able to have a role as a legislative director for Congresswoman Susie Lee from Nevada, uh, which was the role that I always wanted to get to uh, on the Hill to help manage the team of, of folks that, that implement and have portfolios and have agendas. And what I was especially excited about is that she had just joined the Appropriations Committee. And that is uh, where my bread and butter is, what I'm especially interested in. And so helping her team get set up there and get through that first process was was a really nice exclamation point on on at least this iteration of my Hill career. If I go back, I don't know, who knows. But but that was it was a great way to to end my my tenure there as as the role I wanted to get into and the issues I wanted to get work on. And so now what it did is that it allowed me to immediately jump into the work that I do now in the multi-client capacity of saying, hey, you know, we worked on these issues on the Hill as, as an LD, worked on these appropriations issues, authorizing what have you. Like, let's get to work. Like, I'm interested in this. And, and I know it can be intimidating, but, but, but the, it's, it's just people. Like, Congress is just people. And if you learn the right people and how to deal with them, it's actually a lot of fun. So when the um, uh, McCarthy speaker votes were taking place, the ballots, uh, you were probably texting. You were, you were there for part of it, and you were texting your friends. And and uh, <laughs> what was that like being on the inside watching all this unfold? It must have been one of the more um, 
what's the right word? I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, exciting or, you know, kind of, you know, there was a, a lot going on. All the members were in the chamber, which never happens or hardly ever happens. Um, so what was it like being there on the inside watching all this unfold? Oh, it was extraordinary. I mean, in, in, in historic, in, a, in, the tr- in the truest sense of, of the word, not to be a cliche, but I mean, this is one of the easiest votes in Congress right, from a process perspective. It was truly extraordinary, and there were times that I just couldn't even believe that it was happening. It just, it was just, it's just so unheard of. So after like the first ballot, were you like, oh, well, that was fun and that was cute, and here we go, like they'll they'll wrap this up. They they sent their <laughs> message, you know. Now yeah, after the second one, I knew this is going to be long. Oh, you did? Uh, yeah, because, that's what you're like. Oh, something's going on. Okay. At least at least thought it was going to be long because you know there's a number of these characters you know want to have protest votes, you know, against the speaker to send a particular signal on X, Y, and Z thing. You saw the same thing, uh, you know, with Pelosi back in, in 2019. Mm-hmm. But it didn't but they didn't do. Because, but they didn't do this. No, no. And, they threatened. And think, they threatened, but they, they didn't. And she, had, she had a large number of folks that, that voted against her. Many of them, of course, didn't manage a re-election the next time around for because I think overextended the margin. But that's another conversation for another day. But but certainly, I mean, I think that what was fascinating to me was how long now Speaker McCarthy had to close this deal going into the vote mm-hmm. and seemingly gave away so many of his concessions without any increased support. And that's where I was essentially looking at this and going, hey, like, you know, I didn't write out of the deal. I don't have a master's in negotiation, but there's not a lot left from a rules perspective that he can give away. And of course, the really only major change that was made was, you know, changing from the five to the one on the motion to vacate the chair. And the rest were, I mean, but the definition of a backroom deal, right? Like we'll get more more of this particular voting block on a committee's like appropriations or ways and means. And and in some ways that is how how deals are done, right? That's how power is decided. And so I don't think there was necessarily anything untoward about that. The issue that I was getting incoming about was you have a lot of folks that are sort of the mainstay House Republican part of the conference that, you know, is not particularly showy. They were they were McCar- with McCarthy from the beginning and they felt a little out left out to dry because it was it 91 percent of the conference was always behind him. But this nine or 10 percent were essentially holding them hostage in some capacity and were able to extract concessions. And so a number of these supporters were openly grumbling, going, hey, well, where is my, you know, win? You know, where, where's where's the thing that I, I get out of this? And so there was a lot of concern that it was re- rewarding the wrong behavior, right? It was, re- it was incentivizing mm-hmm. obstruction. Uh, but you have to give this this group of 20 or so credit, especially I think the Chip Roy contingent, that were able to really extract a number of, from their perspective, meaningful policy commitments, but also procedural commitments. And we will see how those play out. Uh, you know, the open pool is how long is it before the first snap election, right, on on the on the speaker vote, uh, or the motion to vacate the chair. And a lot of folks forget, like, like it was, you know, it, it didn't actually vote happen in 2015. It was just the threat of the vote happening that was a large part of the impetus behind Speaker Boehner bowing out, right? They didn't actually ever take the vote. It was just the filing of it and the, and the threat behind it. And so I think folks that uh, underplay the importance of that need to look at the lessons of 2015 and, and the impact of, of that on Speaker Boehner as as indicating this the challenge of that and and we have to remember that was it the last six didn't flip they just voted present right and and six still have because of the nature of those small margins still have just such incredible power to wield just chaos on the house floor right just absolute chaos and you know one of the things that stuck out to me was that uh, there was a, a, a plurality, I believe it was, of, of Republican voters that were polled that approved of, I think, the excitement or shenanigans, however you want to describe it. And so there's this question of, well, does that further incentivize 
this sort of obstruction, I, I, it's hard not to put value judgments on it, right? But it, trying to trying to talk about it in the most fair way I can, uh, I think extracting cons, you know concessions out of these sort of choke points in the legislative process, um, I think that portends some challenges for for the speaker. And it was personally fun to see uh, his deputy chief John Legansky sitting next to him, who who I got to know a number of years ago and actually gave me a tour of the House chamber when I was over in the Senate, and we sat in those seats. And it was it was kind of fun to, to see him there and go, oh, that, that poor guy is not getting any sleep. And, you know, and, and it just it brought back a lot of memories of, you know, staying there late, getting there very early, and that sort of thing. But, but as a lover of the institution, not to completely filibuster you here, Jim, but as a lover of the institution, it's, it's troubling to see it uh, struggle certainly uh, even even as a Democrat like my, my partisanship has a, has a point there's a point to it it's not all consuming you know I want these institutions to work and I think that both parties have valuable contributions to the political process and have policy that can help people right so so it's not that you're I don't think anyone should be rooting necessarily for the institution to fail because I don't think anybody benefits there but it but it is concerning for things that Congress has to do debt ceiling, funding the government, making sure certain extenders are done, right? Like the NDAA, um, you know, the, it was it was an, an amusing procedural circus, I think is fair to say, but uh, it, it doesn't portend particularly good things for some of these more difficult votes. And tell us a little bit about um, um, your practice now. Oh, absolutely. So, so my firm is Fager, Drinker, Biddle & Reith. I'm in their consulting practice here in D.C., we have a number of offices across the country, Chicago, Minneapolis, Indianapolis, Philadelphia, New York. And so we have a large law practice. Uh, we're one of the top 50 law firms in the country, if not the world. And our practice does a lot of work in the health space. That's a big part of our book of business. But we also do uh, a lot of things in the environment, manufacturing, technology space. And so as a, as a true multi-client lobbyist, my clients are all over the all over the policy spectrum, and so I have health systems, uh, rare disease groups, have a large additive manufacturing client, uh, have some folks that work in the science space, and so multi-client I think is the easiest analog to being a legislative staffer, right? A legislative staffer has a portfolio of half a dozen, if not close to ten, you know, policy issues. Some that you like more than others, some that you do more. With then others, multi-clients, it's the same thing, right? The, the, the boss becomes the client as opposed to the member, excuse me, or the senator. And so a lot of the work is the same work, right? It's getting bills introduced. It's getting amendments tweaked. It's getting appropriations, programmatic, and, excuse me, report language requests done, right? It's the same work. The difference is, is I can't, you know, introduce a bill, Right, like in the same way that you can as a Hill staff with through through your boss, and so the 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 premium then is on relationships, the ability to network, build consensus, uh, and then be able to persuade. And so, I think the one of the themes of my Hill career is consensus building and and working across very different stakeholder groups to accomplish meaningful incremental reforms. And that is the approach that I take as as a lobbyist now is is being able to work meaningfully with Republicans and Democrats. It sounds like it sounds trite and is a cliche, but it's a big part of what I do, my brand and the firm's value, which is one of the things that attracted me to them. And how many people um, uh, on your team there? So we have a little over 20 in our federal uh, advocacy team. Wow. And then we obviously liaise with our state-based teams, and uh, so so we're a bipartisan, bicameral team, which was very important to me in my search because, you know, if you're a D-only firm or an R-only firm, it seems to me to be challenging when your party is out of power. Uh, you know, if you're providing a, a particular access perspective, that seems challenging to me, and I, I wanted to not be defined by my firm's partisan reputation. And, and so one of the things that was a vote of confidence for me and the firm was how many Republicans 
as well as Democrats, recommended the firm to me. And it's, hmm. okay, this is this fits my goal and my brand. And the nice gratifying part is that over the past year that's just been proven true over and over and over again on the issues that I've been working on, the principles and partners that I that I've been a part of. And some level it's like, I think that I found a culture here where I feel that I fit in and it exemplifies hopefully my collaborative nature and, and fun loving nature and a desire to to deliver meaningful reform as opposed to just collecting fees, you know, and and so that's been a, a true gift. And the the firm's, I think, value on its employees and, and valuing, you know, uh, our, our head of our FPAC practice is a wonderful gentleman named Nick Minetto, and and he he says something, you know, we have this goal of of rich professional lives and rich personal lives, and and that that appeals to me. Absolutely. And and something that I want to exemplify in, in my practice, because I love what I do, but I also love my wife and daughter and I don't want to have to choose. Right. And 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 the firm's never made me. And, and, and that is a gift. And I'm very grateful for it. Well, Brian, it's been great to have you on. Uh, and we're glad to hear that you're working for more than just smiles and diapers. And, uh, <laughs> that's right. That's we're, we're both smiles and diapers and and retainers. Right. Right. Uh, right. All three. <laughs> uh, well, Ryan, it's been great to have you on. And for our listeners out there, remember you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, uh, and you can also sign up for our email uh, at politicallife.net. Um, it's been uh, great to have you on, and we will see our listeners next week. 